live with uh, our one of our favorite guests, Christina Gilberton from Gilberton Law Office. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, ladies. Thanks for having me. Sure. And then Brianna Werner, our uh, chief problem solver here at HR Branches. Good morning, everybody. Here's to a lovely cup of coffee during a nice chilly morning. Okay, so we have been planning this this conversation for you guys for a while now. There were a lot of changes that happened on January 1st. Um, some of them we knew about, some of them uh, kind of came in last minute. So we've been diving into it, breaking it all up. We have a lot of resources for you today, a lot of information on the changes that you need to be aware of, because as of this moment right now, if you don't know what they are, you are behind the times, my friend. So let's keep, let's get you compliant and up to date on everything you need to know. Uh, so we're going to cover a couple different things. We're going to cover the new increases for the minimum wage and exempt thresholds for your salaried employees. We're going to go into uh, talking about the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. That is a big one and does affect um, most employers, especially small business employers. So we're going to have more information for you there, as well as breaking down some of the differences between the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that re that required you to pay uh, paid sick time to your employees for COVID-related uh, reasons and how that works with the new Healthy Families and Workplaces Act and their new edition of the 2021 COVID leave. So uh, to start this morning, let's let's talk about the um, increases on the minimum wage and exempt threshold that small business owners need to know. Uh, what what are they and uh, what do they need to, to know about those? Sorry, I had to take myself off of mute. I'll go ahead and take this one. So yes, minimum wage and your exempt threshold has increased. So first let's talk about minimum wage. This is for hourly employees. So our minimum wage has increased to $12.32 per hour. That's pretty easy and pretty state, uh, straightforward. Uh, in addition to that, our exempt threshold has increased. So what that means is for all of our salaried employees, there is a minimum amount of money that you need to pay them. And that's $40,500 per year. With that said, I want you guys to know, it's really important to know to expect incremental increases. Each year until January 1st, 2024, we're going to see $5,000 increases per year. So next year, um, uh, January 1st, 2022, that threshold is going to go up to $45,000. 2023, 50000 And then it caps off in 2024 at $55,000. In addition to that, it's really important to understand that the, the feds underneath the FLSA break it down per week. And that's what you really want to calculate your employees pay at is a per week. So when we look at this year, $778.85 is what you need to pay your salaried employees per week. If your employees work two hours in that week, you still have to pay them $778.85. So remember, salaried employees are not about tracking your time. It's about doing work and showing up for work. So keep that in mind as you maneuver through this exempt threshold. Again, when it comes to budgetary reasoning, you need to start budgeting for these incremental cost increases throughout the upcoming years. It's really important that you factor these in. And I just want to jump in real quick for anybody that has employees um, or has a location in Denver County, you have a little bit different of a minimum wage. Your minimum wage in Denver County is $14 and 77 cents. So Denver County likes to be a little bit different from the rest of the state. So just keep that in mind if you have uh, employees in that county as well. Absolutely. Uh, in addition to that, um, is tipped employees. Uh, does that differ? I believe in Colorado as a whole, tipped employees now must be, must earn 
um, $9.30 per hour as a tipped employee. Do you know, Christina, what the tipped employee rate is in Denver County? I don't know off the top of my head. I don't remember that they, I, I want to say it was $2.30 less than what the minimum hourly wage is, but let me double check on that. Um, well, I believe, let, I'll see if I can find that because um, I don't have that off the top of my head. You know well, what? I remember guys I with tipped employees. Oh, oh, go ahead. I think I found it $17, I'm sorry, $14 and 77 cents. Yeah, that's the regular minimum wage. Oh, look at that. Durr. Tipped workers. Nine. And remember with your tipped employees, guys, a lot of small yeah. businesses and restaurant owners have been getting in some hot water over the last few years because if you, the way that you split your tips with your employees, if you're going to collect those, um, and maybe Christina can talk to this a little bit, if you do not post that for your customers to know and notify your employees, um, you are not in compliance. So is there any additional information that you wanna provide with that, Christina? Um, <laughs> you I didn't just, mean to put you- <laughs> You kind of just hit it on the head. Like it, it's just very basic. You just wanna make sure that you are posting what the policies are for that, for, for folks, that they do know that. Um, and, and the tipped minimum wage in Denver County is 11.75 an hour. So anyway, hey. get there eventually. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, they they just they're just looking for transparency um, in, in as far as what those shared tips go. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for going there. I think that is really crucial information for some of our small business owners that are watching today. Um, okay. So and you know as we're talking, guys, if you want to include your questions. We are live, we can answer your questions. You have you know, HR professionals here, you have Christina Gilbertson, that's an amazing, incredible attorney. If you wanna ask your questions, please do so in the comments below. Um, and also you know, like and, and share this with anyone that needs this information as well. Speaking of which, I see a question from Derek Malgren. Does FICA tip credit still run off of the federal minimum wage? Um, you know what? That's a really good question, Derek. Um, I am not a tax professional and my tax professional husband is upstairs working. So tell you what, I'll tap into him and see if I can get an answer. Unless Christina, you know that answer. Oh no, I, I know just enough to be dangerous when it comes to tax things. So I try to stay away from those. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. We'll find out for you, Derek. Give us a few and we'll, uh, we'll get there for you. All right, what else you got for hey, us today? Um, so Equal Pay for Equal Work Act. Um, this has been in the uh, works for a while. So this was signed in actually in 2019 and it just went into effect January 1st. And there are quite a few aspects to this act that is going to be required of small businesses. Um, one thing that they do include in the act, it, they have a report that is, was released in March of 2018 by the Institute for Women's Policy Research and the Women's Foundation of Colorado that women in this state earn just 86 cents for every dollar that men earn. Latinas earn 53.5 cents and Black women earn 63.1 cents for every dollar earned by white men. So this act is really surrounding pay equality uh, between men and women in the workplace um, because that gap is still there and it's still impacting our workforce. Um, they said if the wage gap were to be eliminated, a working woman in Colorado would earn on average $7,000 more a year, which could pay for um, childcare costs and um, would cut the poverty rate um, more than 40%. So this is a huge impact to our community um, and supporting those that are not being paid equally. So uh, bearing that in mind, what they're really looking for is um, due diligence among small business owners and some transparency. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the aspects of this act and what small business owners need to know. So um, Rihanna, let's start with you as far as the um, some of the high level fair labor practices, what do they need to start doing and have nipped up 
um, very, very shortly? Oh, there's a number of things, but as a small business owner, I highly encourage the very first step underneath the Equal Pay Act is to do two things. First, get job descriptions in place for every position that you have within your organization. It is now required that you have those job descriptions in place. You don't have to have a job description for each individual, just each position. So if you have three customer service reps, doing the same job, you're good with one job description. However, if you have three uh, customer service reps and a customer service manager, you need to have a job description for that customer service manager and then one for those, those customer service reps. In addition to that, I need you to go back to your employee handbook and review your employee handbook. And if you have a policy that states that you do not allow your employees to talk about their wages, you need to go through and immediately delete that policy because now that practice is illegal. And then your next step is, is to look at the compensation of all of your employees. And you need to make sure that you have fair and equitable pay amongst all like positions. Keeping in mind that you can have some fluctuation in pay based off of experience, knowledge, education, and a few other factors, you still need to make sure that there's pay equity. If you have a disparity, say that customer service rep, again, where you've got one customer service rep that's earning $20 an hour, and then another one that's earning $15 an hour, And there's really no difference in their skills, qualifications, longevity, anything that sets them apart. You need to equal out that pay and make sure that there's comparable pay practices within your organization. Last but not least, when you go to recruit or hire individuals, there's two things that you need to do. First, you need to post the position internally. So take it, print it up, put it on your cork board where you've got all of your employment posters posted, uh, wherever, email it out to your employee base, but you need to make, they say promotional opportunities available to your whole employee base, but let's face it. If you're hiring, there's usually always a promotional opportunity. Very rarely is there not. So just make it a common practice to post all of those internally. In addition to that, when you post internally and externally, now you need to post your pay range as well as your benefits that you offer. Uh, so let's see, Christina, what else do you have? Those are the basics that are that have been boiling up to the top of our radar, but I'm sure you've you've got a lot more. Yeah, it, um, you definitely hit uh, the big ones for sure. Um, as far as like the notice requirements when you're posting, make sure it's you're doing it concurrently. Um, or if you you, you don't want to make it known to your internal employees after you're put, posting out to the public. If you want to do it internally first and then to the public, that's fine. But it, you have to do it at least concurrently. Um, and um, Rihanna mentioned doing an audit, making sure you're going through your pay policies right now and you're looking to see what people are being paid. Um, there is a safe harbor provision of the Equal Pay Act that says, you know, if you go do your due diligence as an employer and then you find that, yeah, there are some inequities because let, let's face it, there probably are going to be some. It's probably not intentional um, in most cases, but, you know, people, you know, different things happen at different times. And um, so you may have people that are doing the same job and getting paid a little bit different. If you're doing those audits and you're making those corrective actions and you're in the process of doing so, um, then you can save yourself from getting hit with a fine um, as long as you're showing that good faith effort to to make that equality happen. And that's important because these fines range from $500 and $10,000 per violation. And that adds up real quick. Um, especially if we're and a lot of times you, the, the, the pay inequities are probably less than that $10,000 mark in a lot of those cases. And so let's make sure that you're being proactive. That's what the, that's one of the biggest things that I um, urge of my clients and, and Rihanna does as well is be proactive. Don't wait for the problem to smack you in the face. I know we've got a lot of things on our plate right now. Things are stressful and uncertain in in a lot of areas um, and and COVID just won't quit, but we need to be 
proactive and we need to try to find the time or find people that can help you identify these areas that are leaving you open to potentially significant fines. And, and just trust me, you don't want the hassle of, of having to deal with an audit from the government. That's going to be far more stressful, painful, and expensive than if you do it yourself the first time around. And there are some guidelines. If you're not really sure um, as you're doing your audit, there are, you're, you need some guidance to make sure you're doing it correctly. Hit up the D Department of Labor website. There's a lot of great resources on there. Reach out to your tax professionals, your uh, HR folks, your attorney, whoever it is that is a trusted partner of yours, and make sure that you're doing what you need to do and doing it, you know, trying to be comprehensive with it. And it sounds like it's a, it's a big task, but um, it doesn't have to be as, as, as stress sounding as, as it, as it might, as it might sound. Um, like I said, you're going to be much better off if you do it up front and save yourself some of those issues and transparency is key. That's, that's the way things are going. And it's, I think it's ultimately going to be good for everybody. It's just an adjustment for folks and just have to remember transparency, notice and be proactive. Those are my three words for the day. I think those should be the three words for the year. So <laughs> let's just, pen that up on our boards right there. Um, I'd like to talk, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about job descriptions because uh, I've seen some interesting ones through uh, my career. And so we actually have an in-house job description expert. And I'm going to put Leah on the spot here and ask for her expert guidance on how to have a quality job description. Because if you just write on a piece of paper, well, they're supposed to do their job which I have seen, doesn't qualify as a job description, right? So Leah, can you just kind of help our viewers wrap their brain around what a job description is just to make sure that they, when they sit down in front of their computer, they cover those basics? Absolutely. So I, I love job descriptions because I think it's such an opportunity to take it to another level. Um, and they can be kind of overwhelming if you're not really sure what goes into them. It typically ends up being just a laundry list of daily tasks. Um, and there's so much more to it that you can do. So um, at the very least, you should be focusing on those essential duties that that person you're requiring them to do, you expect them to do, and that you would judge their performance on, right? So not necessarily every tiny little thing, because that can get overwhelming. And there's always the opportunity to add, um, you know, other duties as assigned, right? You, there's always going to be some variety. Um, and so especially in a small business, we all wear multiple hats. So there's going to be some overlap. Um, <laughs> I've got my little kiddo here today because of the snow. So um Along with that, uh, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities to include goals and um, it, and inspire your your employees. What do you want them to to aspire to and to accomplish? If you include the bare minimum in your job descriptions, um, then that's really what you're going to get. You're absolutely right, Leah. You know. It doesn't have to be a robust, dirty laundry list of each and every task, but a decent high level of those overarching roles and responsibilities and duties. It's also helpful to include the uh, skills that are necessary to successfully complete the job. Is there certain education, knowledge, systems that they have to have experience in or knowledge of in order to be successful? And that's really what does is the key to a quality job description. So thanks for that elaboration. I appreciate it. And sweet little Connor. Oh, he's being so patient. Thank you, Connor. <laughs> um, Christina, what else do we need to address when it comes to the Equal Pay Act? Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else that we really missed. Um, okay. So let's see. I got a question for you, Christina. So, um, I was reading about, so there's record keeping requirements for, for these. Um, now with that, it, there was something in the act that said that they're authorized to enforce actions against an employer concerning transparency and, um, in pay and employment opportunities. So if they are held, um, what do small business employers need to know if they're held to these requirements and they don't maintain adequate um, record keeping? 
Um, well, that's that's part of the you know doing the proactiveness and and um, you can go back. It, it, you're supposed to be keeping records for the entire length of an employee's employment plus two years thereafter. And if you haven't been keeping track of that information, I mean, whether the retroactivity of you know are they going to go back and say, well, you didn't keep this from 2018 or 2019. I don't know that that's going to be a huge issue, but um, I would definitely, you know, if you can, you can usually, you can look back and see what people were, were making and what these issues were. It, it, you don't have to go back and necessarily recreate job descriptions from years ago or anything like that. But if, as they're changing and, and as you're kind of bringing everything current now, just try to do that comprehensive sweep and try to just be as thorough as you can. Um, I think that that's going to be really important. And remember, you're keeping uh, you're keeping these documents the entire length of their employment plus at least two years. That's going to be the minimum going forward. And it sounds like it's a lot of uh, a lot of documentation and record keeping to keep. And um, it, just create a system, delegate, have somebody in your in your business if you can. That's they, that that's one of their job descriptions. I mean, that they're, they're going back and they're documenting and they're updating that, you know, if it, if a job description needs to be updated, make sure that you're actually getting that on the job description. If the pay structure is changing for some reason, say the min, you were paying the minimum wage before and the minimum wage keeps going up, make sure you're reflecting that in your documentation and, and what your record keeping shows and you're just keeping up with that. Um, it doesn't need to be onerous or anything like that. It can be digital record keeping, it can be paper record keeping. It doesn't matter as long as it's record keeping and you can access that, access that information in the event of an audit. So that's just the key is just do what works for your company um, and it's going to be different for everybody, but just make sure you're wearing those 15 pieces of flair for my office space folks from going to the way back machine. Make sure you're doing that, that bare minimum, um, at least to make sure that you're covering yourself. Cause you just, it, it, you don't want to find yourself on the wrong side of things. It's just, it's not worth the risk. Yeah. That's, what that's a what huge helpful tool when it comes to record keeping is going to be your payroll system, uh, leveraging off of all of your payroll records, and then just keeping complementary documentation. Okay, in our payroll records, it is reflecting that we are giving this increase to this person make sure you validate that increase with an offer letter or some sort of promotional letter to that employee that you can put into that personnel file. So it complements one another. I will tell you this, if you're using an accountant rather than a, a payroll service, make sure that they are providing you with the records that you need for all of your payroll processing. You should be receiving some sort of reporting from your payroll provider, whether it's um, your accountant, ADP, Payroll City, whoever that is, make sure you're receiving records on each pay period and what is paid out. That is essential. And you will need to keep those on record and at hand. One big thing is what if you're looking at changing your payroll provider? Um, you want to move from one payroll provider to the other. Well, you're going to lose those records if you don't download them and keep them safe somewhere. So if you do make a transition within payroll, you also need to be cognizant of keeping those records on hand. You can't have them floating out in outer space or you're held liable. So that's going to be a huge compliment in what you do. And I'm telling you guys, if you are using your accountant for payroll, which is very common or a bookkeeper, you need to make sure that you are receiving that payroll documentation. And I also want to clarify for some of our small business owners that may um, be a little confused about the pay equality. You're going to have some pay differences that they are recognizing that, you know, could be merit based. It could be based on seniority. You know, you're going to have employees that have earned their their promotions on their increases as well as they've just worked longer than some other employees. So I just wanted to clarify that. It's a great point. And, and we had mentioned, um, you, it kind of was a focus a lot on the, the male versus female workers, but we need to keep in mind this equality. It's not just gender specific. It's any protected class. So we're talking about race. We're talking about religion. We're talking about all of those other areas that fall under a protected class. So you just want to make sure that there's uh, just compensation and equality there. Just want to make sure that everybody understands. We're not just talking about men and women here. So mm, that's a good point. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for adding that. Okay. Um, is there anything else that 
our viewers need to know before we move on to some of the more uh, complex topics of uh, paid sick time during this pandemic? I just wanted to add one little thing. It's not really necessarily the Equality Act, but it's something that I'm finding with a lot of my clients um, when it comes to hiring new employees. I'm still seeing a lot of questions asking if folks have been convicted of a felony. You got to get rid of it. Ban the box has been in effect now for for a while now. Um, and you can no longer ask somebody if they have a criminal record unless and until offer of employment has actually been made. It's not saying that you can't you make sure that they're okay to be hiring and that they're uh, appropriate for the position. You just have to interview them and you have to offer employment before you can go down that path. And it sounds, it's, it sounds a little bit scary sometimes, um, but again, it's giving that equality and trying to, you know, make sure that people are being evaluated on them, them themselves, the merits of, you know, their qualifications, rather than just being kind of cast aside just because they had to check that box. And so there, are, there's just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it out of a lot of employment contracts or uh, applications I'm seeing for my clients. So. We've done the same thing. It's been a constant conversation here at HR branches. i I'd like to ask you a question about this that we've seen recently. Um, social media and Google searches on candidates can bring up some background issues, some discriminatory issues. Um, it can create a bias during the application recruiting process. What are your thoughts on that, Christina? Well, it's a fine line, I, I certainly think, but if they're putting it out there for public purview and it's something that you, that anybody can just do a Google search or that they, you can just go check out their Facebook pro profile and it shows them, hey, just got out of the slammer, you know, that's, they're putting it out there, you know, it's not something that you're um, forcing them to disclose to you. You know, so I think that that's the big distinction right there. And there's, let's be honest, there's always going to be biases and there's always going to be, you know, we're, we're human, we're victims of the first impressions. And, you know, unfortunately, that's something that you, you just can't get rid of on some level. So just, just be careful with it. Um, uh, I know in the past when I've hired folks, you know, that's one of the first things I do is try to get a sense of this person um, before they come in, um, but try Try to do it with an open mind and, you know, just make sure that you're, you're giving them a fair shot as much as humanly possible. And you're not just saying, oh no, you, you posted something really questionable on Facebook. In some cases, that's going to be a big deal. In other cases, it may not be. So just tread lightly. Absolutely. Boy, you know, the unintentional bias conversation, we could probably have another Facebook live on for like four hours uh, because it's, it's a, it's a tricky thing as long as we're all aware of our unintentional bias. And when, if we do go out there and we do find something, we have to check ourselves first and say, okay, do I have any bias? Am I making a decision based on the good of my business and my organization, or am I making a decision based on my emotion or some sort of bias attached? And that will help center you as an employer in making sound choices for your business. Thank you for that. I knew I, I, I threw you on the spot, but that's been a conversation we've had recently here at HR branches that I think our community could, could use a little guidance on. So I appreciate yep, it. It can be a tough one. So of course. It definitely can. And ban the box is a big one, you guys. Uh, you can put parameters in place and you also have to think in terms of how does this background criminal history issue complement, for lack of better terms, your the position that you're hiring for, right? So if the person is being hired to work with children, well, you really don't, you can't hire someone with a um, sexual assault, especially on a child or you know a, a child abuse case, anything along those lines. So you have to be very aware. Or um, theft, if someone's a fiduciary at your organization, maybe an accountant or something like that, and they have uh, embezzlement charges, well, that applies, right? So you do need to make sure that that's connected. If you're hiring a customer service rep and they have a speeding ticket, well, that doesn't really apply to the situation. 
Yeah, and make sure um, that you understand that the ban the box isn't an excuse to not do your due diligence as a business owner. Um, it changes how you process applicants and, and, and hire new folks, but the due diligence and the requirements and making sure that you're doing those background checks for the, so those uh, special circumstances or, you know, for childcare or fiduciary types of folks, you know, if something were to happen and you, uh, there, I've seen a lot of times that people have, let's say, you know, there's negligent entrustment against an employer for allowing a particular person to fill a role or to interact with certain people or to handle funds or something like that. And you, you're not going to be able to use the excuse, well, ban the box. They told me I couldn't ask those questions as a defense because you still have the opportunity to do so. It's just changed when you have that opportunity to do so. And so I would still strongly suggest that you still jump through all those hoops that you normally would do or that you think are appropriate for your particular industry. Okay, so we have a question on Facebook from our amazing MJ Seiler. First and foremost, MJ, I'm looking at your name on Facebook and I realize I've been spelling your name wrong the whole time. We've been helping you. I've been doing MJ, but I see you've got this really cool spelling to your name that I never knew and you've never corrected me. So I'm going to hold you accountable to correcting me going forward. But anyways, MJ asks, can you legally offer employment contingent on a background check? Yes. Yes. As long as you've actually made, as you're making the offer, I think and that it's again, that transparency to your person, letting them know as, as long as everything comes back clean on your background check, we're good to go. That's fine. It's just, they've already, they've already crossed that threshold and been interviewed and offered the job at that point. You're good to go. Absolutely. And look, Jean Thornton's watching too. Hi, Jean. Um, do HR branches or Ms. Gilbertson perform employment law audits? So HR branches, I'll start with us because I'm stingy and selfish uh, and I'm already talking. HR branches, we're not attorneys. We do not provide legal guidance. We don't pretend to be attorneys. We don't want to be attorneys. However, we do compliance audits. So um, we will go in and we'll check your employment records and your files and posters and look at various hiring practices and compensation practices, and we'll help you understand your risk. And then when we find issues, we contact people like Jean, who is also a local attorney, or Christina, and help us navigate resolving these issues. And I know Christina helps on this level too, don't you, Christina? You know, I do. So yes, I do uh, do audits for folks. Uh, I mean, there's different levels of audits. I know that that Gene with his workplace investigations, he he goes really deep. And so I, if it's something like that, I will, I refer stuff out to Gene for that type of thing. Um, but it's kind of along the same lines of, of what Rihanna was saying in terms of the audit. Uh, I'll go through your, all of your documents, make changes as appropriate, um, make sure that you're apprised of what the legal requirements are and everything like that, just to make sure, you know, Part of my job as a small business attorney is making sure that you're protected. And that includes me auditing a lot of different aspects of your business to make sure that, you know, we're protecting and we're taking those steps needed to, to make sure that your business thrives. So that is one of the pieces of the puzzle, absolutely, that I deal with on a regular basis. <laughs> we like to say around here in HR branches, we get all up in your business. <laughs> all right. Looks like we've got our questions answered. So now we're going to jump into the fun stuff. Leah, you want to lead the way? Okay. So um, as far as the Healthy Families and Workplaces Act, uh, we have covered this topic before with a lot more of those details for that specifically. So I will include that link on our previous Facebook Live, uh, as well as our blog that we put in there. And um, Christina has some great resources as well. So, um, but now what small business owners are trying to do is navigate between the um, the FFCRA, the Healthy Family Workplaces, and now this 2021 COVID leave, um, which is completely separate from the FFCRA. So um, high level, uh, what do our small business owners need to know? Um, Rihanna, do you want to take this one? What do they need to know? So let's start by differentiating the two, because I think that the Healthy Families Act and the um, FFCRA, Families First Coronavirus Act, are 
starting to blur together and it's becoming a little overwhelming um, to understand how they apply. First, we have the, we're gonna go with the Families First Coronavirus Act first. Now this was legislation that they put, our, our federal government put into play, um, I think it was April or May, it's all a blur right now, but in um, early 2020, in response to the COVID pandemic. And this set forth a number of pieces of guidance, but essentially the essence was, is that employers were required to provide paid time off to employees who were experiencing symptoms and going through the testing and or recovery process of COVID, caring for a family member going through such, or caring for a child whose school was closed due to the COVID pandemic and or the facility organization was closed due to a state or medical quarantine or closure. Does that cover it all, Christina? I think it does. I believe so, yep. Okay, anyways, and with that, in association to that, there is an eligible tax credit, payroll tax credit that employers are able to take where when they pay these funds to their employee base, these wages to their employee base for this paid sick time, then what happens is on the back end through your payroll provider, you can get a payroll tax credit that gives you a dollar for dollar, essentially reimbursement tax deduction. So that went on through 2020. Now here we are in 2021. What happens with the FFCRA 2021 is now they made this legislation or these requirements not required, but optional until the end of March. So employers have the option to observe this at the federal level until the end of 2020, uh, March of 2021. You can still get the tax credits if you offer this at the federal level. But what complicates this is now Colorado has come in with the Healthy Families Act. With the Healthy Families Act, it's making paid sick time required for employers. And it's a little bit more of a broad component. Um, Christina, I, I've kind of elaborated on FFCRA. Do you want to take your turn and you can elaborate on the Healthy Families Act and then we'll bring them all together here in a few? Sure thing. So um, under um, the, the new rules effective January 1st. Um, I refer to this as the public health emergency sick leave um, side of things. Um, I know there's different terminology for it, but I'll refer to it as the, as the sick leave just for this purpose. Um, and so as Rihanna said, you know, in 2020, um, employees were, um, el could receive up to 80 hours of, of sick leaves under the Healthy Family and Workplaces Act. Um, and there's been some clarification that came down in the Colorado Senate, um, or the Colorado Department of Labor, I apologize. Um, they issued a clarification just before Christmas, I believe it was actually on Christmas Eve, so it was a nice happy Merry Christmas gift from the state, um, reiterating that the requirement to provide paid sick leave by employers it didn't, it didn't end on December 31st of 2020. It, it is in still, it's still in place. And this is for all employers because we are still in a public health emergency, which is the, the pandemic, you know, the quarantines, all of those things, those qualify as a public health emergency. Um, and it has been uh, uh, designated as such by the government. And it's been extended a number of times here in Colorado and who knows when it's going to end. Um, but under under the um, 2021 Sick Leave Act, basically that 80 hour requirement, the clock was reset. So if you had somebody in 2020 who you paid out their 80 hours of sick leave in 2020, it all starts brand new again right now for as long as the public health emergency lasts. Um, and so that means if the declaration for the public health emergency goes through all of 2021, then you know this, new paid time off requirement um, of that up to 80 hours lasts throughout the entire year. Um, that, um, and, and it, it's, it's difficult for some folks because, you know, a lot of these small businesses, they're, they weren't planning for that necessarily. Um, and so it was one of those ones that snuck up on us that, you know, I think there's, there's, and they justified it because there's different statutes under Colorado law that they're citing to as to 
what applied in 2020 versus what applies now. I'm sure y'all don't want to get into the weeds with that because you're not lawyers and you aren't riveted by statutory uh, interpretation like I am, obviously. Um, but uh, just know that if you have any employees, it doesn't matter how big you are, you need to be able to provide them up to 80 hours of paid sick leave. They can take that all in one lump sum or they can break it up over qualifying events. Um, the pay structure is going to be um, the same as it was under healthy families, um, meaning that full-time employees take their full hourly rate for those 80 hours. Part-time employees will be paid an average salary over a two-week period. Um, they can use the, uh, there's another level of it is, um, it does depend on business sizes to some extent, whether you have 16 or more employees versus 16 or less employees. And that is for when we're not dealing with a public health emergency. So in the event, the public health emergency is declared to be over say the end of March, then we're gonna be focusing on what the pay leave rules are based on your employment size at that point. So I hope that makes sense. So um, if you have 16, more, 16 or more employees, then all of the paid leave, uh, it, it kicks in right then for you. I mean, it, it's kicked in right now um, under Colorado law, but uh, for every hour that somebody, or for every 30 hours that an employee works, they get one hour of paid time off. And we're talking about um, all employees, whether it's a full-time employee, a part-time employee, a seasonal employee, whatever it is, they all qualify for that. Once they hit 30 hours, they get one hour of PTO or paid sick leave. Um, and they can use it as soon as they accrue it. You can't say, okay, well, you have to work for us for 30 days and then you can take your paid sick leave. No, that's, as of right now, if you have 16 or more employees right now, then they, you have to allow them to use that for paid sick leave as soon as they accrue it. Um, there is also some rollover um, from year to year that is going to be a little bit tricky in that uh, folks can accrue up to, oh, I should, I should mention, you know, the, 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 the minimum under the, the law is 48 hours of accrued uh, paid time off. For, for all employees under Colorado law. You can provide them more than that if you want, but you have to make sure that you at least give them 48 hours of paid time off. And from year to year, an employee can carry over up to 48 hours of paid time off. So if they only used 20 hours of, of their PTO uh, here in 2020, then they'd be able to carry over 28 hours into 2022. So it's a lot more record keeping, I, again, Let's find somebody, let's have a job description that includes tracking all of these different things or working with your payroll company, just making sure you're doing all of the, the due diligence on your side for an audit. Um, and then starting in January 1st, 2022, then all of the requirements of the accrual um, for every 30 hours work, they get one hour of paid time off. That will apply for all employers, whether you have one employee or 300 employees, you know, there's some, there's some limitations in there, some differences a little bit, but I'm, I'm guessing most of the folks on this call are going to be on the, the lower end of that spectrum. So just keep in mind, you have technically the next year to get yourself ready for the, the ongoing paid time off requirements um, that are separate and apart from the, the COVID leave essentially that we're dealing with right now. So just keep in mind, there's a lot of different layers to it. I know it's confusing, and we could spend four hours going through all of this and trying to map it out, but just, just be aware there is pay time off requirements. There's at, as of now, there are no carve outs, no exceptions. It's that, that may happen at some point, but as of right now, just plan. If you have any employees, um, January, 2022, this absolutely applies to you. And if you have 16 or more employees, um, as of right now, it applies to you as of January 1st, 2021. So if you haven't been tracking accrued time off for the last 26 days, you need to go back and start doing that and recording that. I, th I think you nailed it. This legislation right here, these two pieces have so many different layers and it's so complex. It's, it's hard for all of us to wrap our, our heads around. So I wanna throw this disclaimer in there. If you have any questions about executing the Healthy Families Act and the Families First Coronavirus Act, contact Christina. 
and ask her questions, pick her brain, contact us, pick our brain. We are here to help you through this. We've torn this information apart and we have a pretty good understanding of it and we can help you through this. So don't feel like you're on an island. You're not ever, ever, ever. And this is some tough stuff to digest. Once we get out of 2021, it should become a little bit less complex and a little straightforward, but right now we're just in the minutia of complexity. Um, in addition to that, I promised you we would kind of bring it all together. So Families First Coronavirus Act, Healthy Families Act, how do they collide? Because right now the feds are saying it's optional. Colorado saying it's not optional, right? So how does that intermingle together? And Christina, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way we're interpreting this is it is not optional for any of us here in Colorado. We do have to execute this paid time off underneath the public health emergency component of the Healthy Families Act. However, the Families First Coronavirus Act has a nice little compliment. Remember I talked about that tax credit? until the end of March, you can leverage off of that tax credit to help you pay for this sick paid time for your employees. Right now, as it sits, it's set to expire at the end of March. So we need to start planning and preparing. Remember what Christina told us a little while ago? After March, these tax credits may go, which means us as employers are forced to absorb that cost. Maybe they'll extend it, maybe they won't. Right now, I always say plan for the worst, hope for the best. Right now, we need a plan for the worst. We need to budget to absorb these costs because I don't see this public health emergency going away at the end of March. It's going to be extended. I'd be willing to put money on this. Um, but now that I just put money on it and I'm a really lousy gambler, hopefully it'll go away. <laughs> um, anyways, so with that said, that's kind of the big component in bringing these two pieces together is right now we are required to pay our employees for pandemic related sick time off. However, we can experience this pay or this payroll tax credit. With this payroll tax credit, this is important. If you have paid out any type of paid sick leave underneath either of these two acts to your employees that are associated to our current public health crisis, contact your payroll provider. I have seen all walks of payroll providers, and they have been wrapping their heads around this and putting systems in place to support you, to help you get these tax credits that you're entitled to. If you haven't taken action on this yet, please do it today. This is important money that can help you thrive or at least survive right now. Um, Christina, anything else or any corrections, any other interpretations on how we bring these two together? Not at all. I think you, you hit it right on the head. And, and I know some of you at, right now are probably thinking, how on earth am I expected to, to cover these costs when business is still down? And, you know, it's, I've exhausted my PPP loan and all of those things. So good news um, that may have been lost in the chatter of everything else that's going on. You know, it's been a pretty quiet January. I don't know why you wouldn't be distracted, but um, there is um, there is new legislation reopening the PPP program, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, um, and that includes for first time folks that are that need a little bit of assistance, as well as if you already took a, a draw on your pay uh, on a PPP in 2020, you may be eligible to take a second draw to help cover some of these costs. And so make sure. Um, I would reach out to um, the SBDC has a ton of information on that. This um, there's a lot of different resources. I can certainly help sh shed some light on it. I'm sure Rihanna can as well. <laughs> Uh, we've got great friends at the Colorado Enterprise Fund. If you have questions, they are very knowledgeable and can help you with your PPP. We highly recommend them. They're phenomenal. You can also go to your bank. Um, I think 90% of all banks out there are executing PPPs. So if you have a relationship with your banker and you trust them and go to them, they can help you as well. Absolutely. And, and there are a little bit of different differentiations from the first round of PPP loans that um, on one hand are good because they expand the types of uses that you can use those funds for to and still obtain forgiveness for those. Um, but there's also new, especially if you're looking at a second draw 
um, then there's different benchmarks that you have to be able to demonstrate that your business has suffered in order to be able to get a second PPP draw, but you know, it's worth a shot. You know, if you apply for it or a different, there's different grants for different companies, um, based on the industry. Um, I mean, it's all, it's all there. And so you owe it to yourself and your business to see, to check it out, to see if it's something that you're eligible for worst case scenario, maybe you're not eligible, but I think you might be surprised that a lot of you could qualify for a second loan perhaps under the PPP and you just don't realize it. So don't let the fact that you may have already received money um, from the COVID packages and stimulus packages that have come out prior, make sure that you're you're in contact with your banker or whoever um, that you dealt with for that first round and make sure that you understand, you know, there's maybe, there may be a little bit more hope out there for you to help get through these, these tough times. Um, And then also, It's been clarified. It went back and forth a a zillion times, I feel like, over the last six months. PPP loans are not taxable. They're not taxable, which is fantastic. Great Um, news. That was like celebration in our household when we found that out. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's on two levels. So the, the loans themselves are not taxable as income to your business. And secondarily, the business expenses that you pay using your PPP loans those are tax deductible. So essentially you're getting the money and then you're still able to write off the expenses that you paid using that money. And so it's, it's fantastic. It's like, like man said, it's, it's celebration time. I mean, and in, in a world where it seems like the glimmers of hopes are, are, are few and far between, this is absolutely one that I think all of us are excited about. So just again, no, you're not alone out there and there are resources for you. Is everybody's head feel like it's about to explode? We have just covered some really important information in, wow, 57 minutes. No, 53 minutes. I apologize. I am super impressed. Um, Any final thoughts that we need to address? Final tips, tricks, considerations, Leah? I don't have everything. I feel like, man, you guys just dove into it, went to a great level of detail that, you know, I think so many business owners are needing right now just to, to, just to even hear this, the way we talk about it and going back and forth and dissect it a little bit with the common questions that we get, um, just to give them a little bit more guidance and peace of mind. But of course, you know, if you guys have any questions following this, please reach out to us, reach out to Christina, um, the Pikes Peak SBDC. I mean, you have so many resources available to you. You don't have to like, like Rihanna, like you said, you don't have to be on an island. Um, there's so many people that are more than happy and willing and trying to bang down your door to help you um, dissect this information, figure out, okay, what's the best way to, to deal with this in your business? Um, what are those risks? And, you know, how can you navigate these, these crazy times um, and not just survive, but thrive through them? So please reach out if you need any sort of guidance or if you have any questions. Um, and then, of course, you know, we post a lot of really great content. So does Christina. So if you follow us on social, um, like and comment, please. This was so much incredible information. So please share this with somebody right now that you know needs this information in their business. Um, And just know that we're here as a resource for you. Absolutely. Hey, really quick, I want to circle back around. Derek asked another question way back at the beginning. And I promised him on the chat that we would circle back around to his question. He asked, um, and this is a great question that, um, we should address. Uh, there's been talks out at the Capitol that uh, Biden is proposing that he, that they increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. We've been watching this closely. If that does happen, what happens here in Colorado? Christina, do you want to jump in and, and talk about what happens when the feds increase the minimum wage above and beyond ours? we have to increase our minimum wage to match. We can always, states can always do better than what the feds do, but we can't do worse. So we can be more stringent on some laws, we can, and everything, but if the feds say it's a $15 minimum wage, it's a $15 minimum wage here, regardless if you're in Denver or elsewhere. So, (laughs) fun. (laughs) 
Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty easy and cut and dry, but I wanted to address that for Derek really quick before we close out. So thank you, Christina. I didn't realize it. It's been 10 years since minimum wage has been increased at the federal level. So a little bit of time. Anyway, okay. So here we are, um, just a couple minutes left. Christina, do you have any final thoughts, uh, words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our viewers before we, we part ways? Um, I think it just goes back to, I know this is a lot to digest and we threw a lot of information at you and we threw it at you fast. And you know some things may have been hard to follow because they are hard to follow. Um, Rihanna, Leah and I have dug into this and we still have questions on a regular basis that we're reaching out to each other like, hey, wait a minute, let's double check what's your take on this. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, that's okay. It's normal, just get the help, reach out, whether it's to us or to, to somebody else, reach out, you know, make sure that you're, you understand how the laws and all these regulations impact your business specifically. This, this talk today, it was educational um, and it's intended to be taken as such. It's not specifically, uh, I have to do my disclaimer. It's not intended to be specific legal advice um, because your situation may have some nuance to it that would change the applicability of any of the things that we've talked about today. So um, if you have a question about how it applies to your business, reach out to one of us, to the SBDC, to whoever um, that you trust that knows about these things so that you can make sure that you're doing what you need to do for your business. This is not a one size fits all world. And um, there are some things that we still kind of have to try to I always get it wrong. You try to fit a square peg in a round hole or a round hole and a round peg in a square hole. I always get it backwards, but you, there's help out there to help make it happen. Um, but we just know, we know that there's differences. We know that you're probably overwhelmed and you don't even know where to start. My uh, suggestion, just start. Find something, pick it and, and, and start trying to figure out and understand it find somebody that you can trust that you can pick up the phone and call them and have them walk you through it. Uh, ignorance is not going to be a defense. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you can't, you, you can't, uh, if you get audited, then, and somebody says something, you know, that you were doing something wrong, you can't use, I didn't understand it or oops, as a defense, the government's not going to care. And the government's given out a lot of money in the last 12 months. And there's for the foreseeable future, they're gonna be wanting to try to recoup that money somewhere. And so not to be Debbie Downer, but I am the lawyer on the call and I have to be the like pragmatic, look for the worst possible outcome. There's gonna be a, a, my prediction and I have nothing specifically to hedge this on. I haven't like, don't have secret Intel or anything like that. But I think that there's gonna be a lot more government crackdowns on audits and things like that, because you know what, fines help pay back all of this money that we're borrowing and that we're, that they're giving away to us. So just be more diligent. I know most business owners are probably pretty lax and have been in the past and they've gotten away with it. I wouldn't hedge my bets that that's going to continue on quite the way that it has. So again, not to be the Debbie Downer and end on a super somber note. So hopefully Rihanna can go back and spin this and to a happy ending. So pressure's on. <laughs> Always forced to be the optimist, huh? <laughs> I do have to reiterate what Christina said, though. I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Christina. Um, I'd be willing to to place that bet alongside with you that they might be overwhelmed today, but give them a little bit of time. When they get it all together, they're going to be looking and evaluating at how they can recoup some of this money. Uh, money's never free, and they will be able to come into any organization and leverage some sort of finer fee. So it's up to you to limit that exposure and your risk. Luckily, you have people at your disposal who can help you limit your risk. And that's what it's all about is finding those opportunities to make sure that everything you as an employer have built is in good standing and in a good position because it is much easier to take a proactive action than a reactive action. Uh, here at HR Branches, we are here and fully committed to helping you guys. This video recording is going to be, uh, well, it is 
being recorded and it will be distributed through HR branches, our Facebook page, our newsletter, uh, so on and so forth. In addition to that, I highly encourage you guys to go to Christina's well website, gilbertsonlawoffice.com and sign up for her newsletter. Every Sunday, she sends out the best newsletter. She covers every single legal consideration under the sun in a bite size, easy to understand, digest and apply manner. So she takes little topics every single Sunday and sends it out. That means every single year you can get 52 pieces of free legal advice, which is pretty substantial if you ask me. So please, if you do anything today, go sign up for for uh, Christina, I almost said Leah, <laughs> Christina's newsletter. Um, I'm assuming I'm going to be sending her this link. So she'll probably send out this recording to her, her newsletter distribution list as well. Uh, if you guys have any additional questions or thoughts, feel free to reach out to us. You can uh, continue to add questions down below in the comments below, and we'll hop in and answer them as they come in. All right, Leah, we'll send this over to you for a final farewell. Thank you guys so, so much for doing this today, despite like the snow and the roads and the school closures and the crazy toddlers. <laughs> um, I, I hope that we brought you some incredible value today. You know, this is, um, we break down a lot of information for our members and, and Christina does as well. She's got an incredible membership too. Um, but, you know, some information we like to have as public knowledge for those small business owners, you may only have one or two employees, but this affects you. And it's definitely, you know, this last Last year has definitely impacted your business. So where we can provide that, that complimentary information, we want to bring this to you and provide free training. So um, please feel free to, to follow us on social, um, on our, our Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Christina's as well. We all post really great content that, you know, if you, um, if you're just trying to get by and, you need some of this information. You need to stay up to date in your business. At least you have access to that. There's a ton of free content out there um, to support you. So uh, follow us, like us, please um, comment. If you have any questions, let us know if there's any other topics that you would really like to see us dive into um, and share this information with someone that needs it today. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have loved to talk about this um, incredible information with you. Thank you.